regularly scheduled meeting to order. We had a closed session starting at 4 o'clock. There were two items on that agenda. And right now, there's nothing to report out of either one of those items. So we will move forward with the regular meeting agenda. And first item is the roll call. If the clerk will please note that all council members, with the exception of council member Eater, are in attendance. And now we will have the salute to the flag. Sebastopol Cat. A proclamation of the City Council of the City of Sebastopol recognizing Patrick Amio for his donation of the Slow Down Sebastopol Cat. Whereas Patrick Amio is a renowned artist who lives in Sebastopol, and whereas Patrick is a community minded individual who has donated his time and talent to support local schools and Whereas, Patrick is well aware of the community's desire to make Sebastopol as pedestrian and bicycle friendly and the community's desire to enhance traffic safety. And he conceived of an artistic method of enhancing pedestrian and bicycle safety. And whereas, Patrick built and designed the Slow Down Sebastopol Cat and donated the Slow Down Sebastopol Cat to the city of Sebastopol. And whereas, the Slow Down Sebastopol Cat has been embraced by the community and has already improved pedestrian and bicycle safety and traffic safety. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Patrick Slater, on behalf of the City Council of the City of Sebastopol, do hereby thank Patrick Amio for his donation to the City of Sebastopol and to this community, in witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand on the seal of the City of Sebastopol this 21st day of July 2015. And on top of the thanks for this particular item, uh, just a big thanks on behalf of all the community projects that you donate and support. The calendar every year is, is enormous. I know the World Friends, um, there's one Diana has. Every year it's a, it's a great thing that, that they are able to use in our World Friends organization as a, as a way to spread the Sebastopolness of us all, um, whatever that means. So, so thank you for that, and if you'd like to come forward and say a couple of things, we all still so packed, I'll make an announcement on behalf of the Chief, and that is that the Sebastopol Police Department is going to have its annual open house on August 4th, which is the next council meeting, but don't worry, you can go beforehand because it starts at 5, and I believe it runs till 7, 8, and there will be all manner of good things to do. You can take a tour of the Police Department facility. I think you can probably get locked in one of the holding cells if you'd like. <laughs> or if you misbehave, if you don't like it. Um, so that's always a, a fun event. So I, I'm certainly going to be there ahead of the council meeting. So uh, look forward to seeing as many people there as possible. So now we have the approval of minutes. And we have two.
two meetings that we will be looking at. We have the meeting of June 30th. Are there any revisions or corrections? Is there a motion to approve? Is there a second? Is there any opposition? Aries? Next we have the meeting of July 7th, 2015. Are there any edits or corrections? Is there a motion to approve? Is there a second? Any opposition? Unanimously. We have, let's see, public comments at this time. Uh, opportunity for comments on items that are not on tonight's agenda. Folks could please come forward and observe the three minute time limit. And please state your name for the record. There's a whole lot of us up here. Now. I know. <laughs> I had to elbow them out of the way. Eleven, we just Easter, but they can have you. You know, at the last council meeting, uh, there was a wonderful conversation by a young woman who said how she couldn't shop in Sebastopol, and it made me think of how similar her conversations are to the seniors and to many people that I know, regardless of where they are in the strata. And the only thing I could think that was different between what she was saying and what I would be saying is I would be minus their $300 wardrobe in my closet. <laughs> not, that's not to discriminate anyway. But it made me think a lot because I've had a hard time with the library landscaping getting money when others didn't. And I struggled through that. And I went, what's bothering you? And I thought, I can't understand the logic. I can't understand the logic. And Council Member uh, Glass, you said, you know, there's written information that you get to make those decisions. So first, I want you to know, I respect everything you do, because I can see the amount of work that goes in. But this image is indelibly etched in my brain, and that is, we have beautiful flowers and landscape around the library, and right next door, people are sweating to figure out how to meet the needs. So I uh, just need to put that out there, because that's been rankling me. So what I really began to look at is, what do we say around here? Tourist dollars, grab the tourist dollars. Well, they're kind of a whip around. You get them once and that's it, maybe a few times. We don't get the local dollars. And you know who does a great job on this? Wow, my time is really almost out. Is the City Planning Commission. They're amazing, they're amazing. They talk about small box stores and all sorts of things. And I look at them and I go, what are you saying? The other thing I want to say is Baskin Robbins, that sound bite of, you know, people are going to other places, that's got to go, because that's not true. You know, a lot of people chose Baskin Robbins over. So I just go, what do we say and how we say that and what does that do to our brains? When I found that Earth Child store was going to be given, sold or whatever, I'm going, what is wrong here? And I think your goal to get an economic staff person, I don't know the title, but I think that is so great. I know you know more than I know. Okay, I really want to be clear about that. But I just really want to say to us, let us go for our local dollars. Figure out a way to bring our local dollars home here instead of the tourist dollars, or maybe compliment them to them. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Next speaker, please, Michael. Good afternoon. Michael Karnaki, 385 Murphy Street. I just uh, didn't really plan on talking tonight, but I just want to give you a quick update on what's happening with High Noon. Um, we're circulating a petition that's been signed by pretty much nearly every business downtown to purchase a train line. And put it on top of one of the roofs. Uh, however, before we rush out and do that, we're, I'm talking to um, Ron Sturgeon, who owns Sturgeon Tree Mills. I think they have one that would go loan us for, to try it first, to make sure it's, it's doable before we do that. And then I called Russ Pinto, because he's a train enthusiast, and he's like, oh my god, I've got my brain working now. <laughs> he's like, oh, we could have a Doppler effect and everything. <laughs> so he was all excited, he could barely wait to get off the phone. So I've heard back from him. That. So he's pretty excited. Um, uh, so, um, 
and I uh, talked to the chief about it, and he had mentioned that one of the cops, uh, was it the motor cop, is that correct? Uh, it had just happened to be downtown at noon, and <laughs> couldn't figure out why we put it out <laughs> down the street. And not only that, around the corner, I guess, but apparently too, so it's not just downtown, it's starting to spread out a little bit, which is kind of cool. And so I was reading on John's website, and he pointed me to this website, Public Citizen, uh, Sebastian Citizen, and he had said the motive unknown at one point, I mean, after my public comment, I got up here and spoke. And so um, I think that, you know, again, it just comes back down to it's real easy for us to all get together when there's, you know, tragedy. Or, you know, when there's uh, an ambulance out on the street, everybody's out. You know, so we just, we're trying to, like, get together on, under a different emotion than sadness and pain and suffering and sorrow and just to celebrate life more. And, and uh, <clears throat> so this petition, I think that um, Sarah could sign it. And Patrick, is your, are you in the district? Yes, I can answer oh. that. Right. Okay. And I know Robert's in the, in the district, so you could sign the petition if you want. Um, and it's just basically if we should spend up to $2,000 on promotion of the high name, maybe run an ad, come join us for, you know, it's really a, an experiment in, in uh, human consciousness, I guess, and human biological experiment to see what happens. I mean, you know, we certainly, it was wild last week. So I encourage everybody to come down and just experience it because it's a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. And a question on that. Um, the, the the main intersection in town where the folks gather with their signs on Friday, are they participating as well? You know, I, I, I would imagine that they kind of have to. Uh, yeah, on one, at one point I was down there, I tried to, most people just come out of their businesses. So, and, and so when they do, we don't really get a good chance to see everybody who's out. So a uh, police chief suggested that we run a car down filming so that way you can get a good picture of everybody. So we're going to put that out eventually. We're going to send a card on there. Um, so I remember at one point I was across on the other side of the street and I was waving to them. Mm -hmm. So they were they were definitely participating. Um, cool. Thanks. That's fun. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak to Okay, we'll close public comment. And I will request any statements of conflicts of interest from any council members. Now we'll move to the consent calendar. We have three items on the consent calendar. Does any council member wish to remove any of these? No. no? Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. My goodness. <laughs> So for the record, item number three, approval of extension of contract with the community outreach coordinator. Item number four, which is the second item, approval of resolution setting the fee for the mayor and city clerk to solemnize marriage within the city. And item number five, approval to authorize the mayor to sign his name to the letter of support to Governor Brown calling for a moratorium on fracking statewide. So is there any opposition to, be to this? Carries unanimously. Please. I just want to thank Holly for your excellent amazing service. It's more than I think I as a council member thought it was when you first designed the position. And just wanted to directly express my appreciation. So noted. <laughs> Moving forward, we have no informational items or presentations or book reports this week. We don't have any public hearings. And we have a few items on the regular calendar. Number six is discussion and action to conduct a city-sponsored parklet for parking day. And this is brought to us by myself and the vice mayor. However, I will look to the city manager for a brief staff report. This item is to request that the City Council discuss and act upon the request to conduct a city-sponsored park flip for Parking Day, September 18, 2015. And parking Day is the annual open source global event where citizens uh, collaborate to temporarily transform parking spaces into capital letter parking spaces, which are temporary public places. In March of this year, the City Council approved a resolution which, which approved the submittal of an encroachment permit application 
by the core project of the state of California for temporarily doing this in September of this year. And the council then approved a resolution setting forth guidelines and procedures which are to be followed uh, for park establishing parklets. The core project has been working on the idea of developing several parklets downtown for parking day 2015 to test the waters with obtaining a Caltrans encroachment permit. City staff has sent the city's parklet application process to the core project. The core project has some concerns which they've expressed to city staff about the difficulty of the application process and the cost of the deposit and application fee. The council is being requested to determine tonight if a modified approach to be approved for this one day event, whereby the council might consider not having parklets on a state highway this year, but consider allowing businesses who may be interested in parking day to submit a request to the city of Sebastopol for use of a parking space in the city parking lot. If we did not need to place a parklet in the state right of way, then they would not be required to go through the entire process. In addition, this agenda item asks the council to consider sponsoring a parklet for the city council in possible conjunction and participation with the Sebastopol Library, Friends of the Sebastopol Library, and or the Lantern Group to create a parklet that's open and welcoming to passersby near to the city hall or library to learn about the library and to take time to stop and have a conversation. The council is in support of this project. Council will be asked to provide suggestions for locations and city staff will be asked to work with the library and or the Friends of the Library and Lantern Group on parklet ideas. So the staff recommendation is the city council discuss and act upon the request to conduct a city-sponsored parklet for parking day this year, September 18, 2015. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions on the part of the council for staff? Please. I noticed on page two, um, third paragraph down, no, the core project trying to engage Caltrans, minor plan check deposit of $1,000, cost could be higher, 480 is the fee with Caltrans, and then whatever the rest of the equipment permit takes time, money, energy. And I'm wondering, um, for me, parklets have a significant benefit to the city of Sebastopol, um, creating additional park space, getting businesses to pay for that improvement, um, engagement and that has um, a, a positive impact as far as park square footage, public space square footage, open space square footage, I mean, for our uh, residents and customers of the town. And I wonder if part of this resolution, if, and I know I was hoping that Sue was going to be here, I'm glad that Rich is here, <clears throat> if part of this resolution could be uh, the council directing and funding staff to engage Caltrans on this issue so we could potentially by next year have a solution in place um, for uh, having a park that's on one of the highways. City staff would have, be happy to take on the project of engaging Caltrans either as part of the item this year if the council determines to go forward and permit a parklet project on a state highway or if the council does not go that route, nevertheless staff would also be happy to engage uh, Caltrans and figure out a process and the people to contact to do it next year. Vice Mayor So I appreciate your question. I think it's important not to conflate the two issues. One is parking day and the other is parklets. So for parking day, it's just a one day reuse of real estate that's presently dedicated for cars to some other purpose like people <laughs> and parks and something not automobile driven, I was gonna say, not automobile related. Parklets are a much bigger issue and I fully support um, Council Member Jacobs' longer range concern that we engage with Caltrans and, and create a process where Caltrans will help in a collaborative way so that we could have parklets 
between our future, in other words, uh, commitment of space beyond one day, whether that's temporary for a designated period of time, a year or two, or permanently uh, to that other use than cars. So this is a really fun idea, um, and we're looking at an opportunity here to maybe do an end run around Caltrans for the one day issue and uh, dedicate space in our municipal lots, which I fully support. And then the other issue is if the council wants to uh, participate in having one in collaboration with some library folks, which I also fully support. Thank you for that question. Which I believe support. <laughs> 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 Council Member Glass, anything? Thank you. I have a, a comment and suggestion. Should I wait for public sure. comment? Yeah, let's wait for public comment. Okay. Which I will call for right now. A member of the public wishes to speak on this. Three minute time limit. Please state your name for the record. Paul Fritz. Um, I'm a representative of the core project, and um, so I guess you know, this issue for us, um, one of the reasons we wanted to try to do this this year was to really engage with Caltrans. You know, we've sort of been tiptoeing around Caltrans on this issue for several years, and um, our interest is really, we want to take it to Caltrans, we want to make this, all right, what are we going to do? And we've talked about this some, and uh, you know, our concern with the, the process that was given to us was really kind of some of the costs. And we, we, as an organization, don't really have a lot of money. And we understand, you know, you don't really have any control over what Caltrans' fees are. So we were assuming maybe since the city is sort of supporting this, that the city could somehow waive the fees um, of review for this, this one-day trial event. Um, you know, we, we, we and the other businesses that are participating could hopefully then share the cost of the encroachment permit with Caltrans. Um, but we, as an organization, feel strongly that, you know, that's really what we want to do is sort of push this issue and, and take it to Caltrans. And if that, you know, cannot happen by parking day this year, September 18th, if it happens in October or November or whenever it is, any kind of one day that we can do this as a trial, um, we would be much more excited about that than you know, doing it on a city parking lot, to be quite honest. So that's just kind of where we're coming from. And um, you know, we're willing to help in terms of uh, coordinating with Caltrans. We're happy to fill out the application, do the drawings, whatever it takes to for the city public works to review, but then also for Caltrans to review. You know, we're, we're happy to do that. We are open to engaging with, with Caltrans in whatever way possible. I don't know if Caltrans is only, you know, will engage with someone from the city or not, but, you know, we are, that's kind of what our focus is at this point, is, you know, really getting Caltrans to, to take a look at this. And we've sort of come up with some preliminary design for what could be a sort of standard, very inexpensive sort of enclosure for parking day this year that would, you know, we could all the businesses or organizations that want to have a park that on parking day or for this one day event. We have a very simple, straightforward um, enclosure that would be a barrier basically between the parking space and the traffic lanes. Um, so we can bring that forward to Caltrans and the city for further review. And uh, appreciate your help. Thanks. Any other member of the public wish to speak on this? We will close public comment. Council Member Glass. Well, I spent um, most of yesterday with Caltrans. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry. <laughs> no, actually, this was good. <laughs> um, so uh, I was in a meeting with um, the Chief Deputy Director of Cal Caltrans, who manages 114,000 people. Um, and um, we had a lot of discussion about um, Caltrans' new strategic plan and Caltrans new strategic plan includes the notion that um, it's, it's very ambitious. They're trying to um, triple um, bicycle usage and double pedestrian slash transit usage by 2020. That's in five years. That's extremely ambitious. But I'm wondering if given their new view of the universe, which was very interesting, I was there with um, heads of several postal agencies and, and other people in state government. Um, 
everybody kept saying, wow, this is really, this is the new Caltrans. This is a sea change in attitude with Caltrans. And um, they really are talking about, you know, how to get more, more pedestrian involvement, people out on sidewalks and things. So I'm just, I'm thinking, well, this is a big opportunity to engage with them in a new way. Um, I have the name of somebody I could pass on to you, Paul, that maybe you could send a letter to. But I'm wondering if our city, in its interest in promoting this idea, could um, A, engage with other cities that have done the parklet idea when we're at the League of Cities, and um, talk to other cities that are working with this issue in order to promote the idea and there's always strength in numbers so let's get um, some other cities that are promoting this idea of getting people out out of their cars on the sidewalk engaging with their community and um, see if we can get a bunch of people talking to caltrans about this idea and how we can make it more viable so that's my thought um, I, I did a little research to find out. It was just a quick Google search on the on the park, Parking Bay website, and they've got a map of, of locations. And it didn't appear that any other community has had a, an officially Parking Bay sponsored parklet on any state controlled highway. So. That conversation, this may be the first time Caltrans has ever had it. Mm -hmm. Not to say that it's not a good idea to band together if it's possible. I also have a name and phone number. It just came through into my email box just this afternoon, so I haven't had a chance to make contact with this person yet. But it's somebody that the, uh, not the core project, uh, Cheetah Slow, is in communication with regarding, I forget what the project is on their behalf, but somebody who may be helpful towards us, and I was going to place that call first thing tomorrow morning um, just to see if we can manage to, to get some sort of an approval for this year. So, other comments? Well, I support uh, the, core pro the core project request to the council tonight uh, to push Caltrans. I think we ought to do that, and we ought to do it with uh, council member Glass's contact, use that. Uh, if Mayor Slater has a contact, let's use that because our pressure this year may make it more likely next year if we have to wait. Uh, I think we should uh, suggest to Caltrans, if this has never happened, you want to do this first in Zavascal because we really believe in this dedication of real estate to our pedestrians, to our cyclists, and to our community. So I say yes, let's go ahead with both of those suggestions. And I appreciate you both being so well connected that we could do that. <laughs> well, another thing that, that I'm interested in, in us having a very brief discussion about is the cost of the city fees on this. And for the, the permanent parklet that we talked about before and then we have the copy of the, of the creation of the resolution of, of that procedure, the plan check fees that are for that procedure appear reasonable and fair for a permanent parklet. For a one day in and out procedure, it seems a bit onerous, at least on, on the way I look at it, to have this level of cost for a one-day temporary event. And I'm wondering if there's any interest in perhaps the city waiving city fees for the one-day event, not for potentially permanent parklets in this case. There will still be, assuming we go forward with the Caltrans thing, I pretty much can guarantee that they will not waive fees. And the core project has stated that the merchants that are interested in sponsoring the one-day parklets are are willing to band together and split the cost of the Caltrans encroachment permit. However, the additional cost of the city permit for the one-day event was somewhat un unforeseen by them and uh, a, a bit, in my opinion, a bit high. How much is that? Caltrans or city? It's, it's listed here. It would be the application fee is $480 and then the plan check deposit which is 
anything that's not used is up to $1,000. I don't believe that the plan check in this case, and I, I don't know, I would have to check the staff on this, but the, the plan check for something like this would probably move fairly rapidly and not use $1,000 worth of time and effort on behalf of the city. Staff? Does anybody can comment on? Sue's not here, so. I'm pretty sure you're right that we use very little of the deposit. Right. But, you know, there also the grounds exist to waive the fee if you were to do so. Mm -hmm. I would support waiving the fee, uh, at least for this year, to get this launched as a community activity. Yeah, we did that uh, last year for the village building convergence as well, so there's precedent for that. And I think it's well worth doing now. Mm -hmm. uh, the more of these uh, converted parking spaces that we have on one day, the louder the message, the more fun it is. Mm -hmm. Didn't we not waive the I think we did. I think I wrote a check. That's our call. So, I just, so I, I mean, because I, I think that, that we had a consistent message that I, I never have to wait for fees. I'd rather donate money and, and have the organization pay fees to the city because we have a fee structure that's at cost. Mm -hmm. So, when we waive fees, we lose money. And I don't believe that as a city we're in the business of losing money. Um, so, I don't really like parklets. <laughs> 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 two, two values colliding, but uh, I don't know how I'll vote, but I don't okay. think I have to say that again. Okay. I would vote to support parklets, I'm sure. But. Okay. So, the other item that we're looking at uh, on top of uh, perhaps waiving the fee is, is the city interested in sponsoring in conjunction with the Friends of the Library and Lantern our own parklet that we can put up and hang out in during parking day. I think that's a really great idea. In fact, I think I might have suggested it to the mayor. And it would be one way of celebrating our lovely two civic buildings there uh, and our beautiful landscaping and supporting the library. Uh, also, it's, I think, um, compatible with Holly's effort, the table at the farm market. In other words, city government is making ourselves available on the street, in the parking place, there that day, all day long, for people who want to come and ask questions. And I think that's who we're supposed to be. P.S. I'll be out of town that day. <laughs> I didn't know. P.S. I'll be out of town. That's how you do it. So, so uh, I, I think uh, we're probably ready to move on this. Uh, so I believe this is a three-part motion. Uh, I would move that we waive fees for uh, parties interested in a parklet activity on Parking Day 2015. I would also uh, move that we allow interested parties to request a parking space in our municipal lot if they prefer that to a street space or a highway space, and that the council sponsor a space on parking day uh, with our library collaborators. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. No opposed. Motion carries. That will be a fun day. So then we get Caltrans on board. I'm just checking. Do we need a motion, uh, Madam City Clerk, about contacting Caltrans and the um, other party that the mayor mentioned? Do we need any direction that way? Okay. So you guys will just move ahead on Yep. And we'll report back to council um, on that. And probably also the hall. Okay, we're moving on to item number seven, and this is an informational item requested by council on um, three or four properties that are on Gravenstein Highway North, just um, to the south of the O'Reilly property. Uh, planning Director Webster. Yes, the council. Uh, had requested information on these uh, parcels, which are, relatively speaking, 
but somewhat underdeveloped. So the staff report provides um, information about them. Um, the only current permit activity is on one of the parcels 845, the former Amerigas site, where just recently the city received a preliminary review application for a mixed use development project. So information about that um, concept is attached to the staff report. Um, otherwise, there are no pending development applications relating to these sites. Staff report also provides information about the zoning. They're all zoned the same, CG general commercial, where a wide range of commercial uses are allowed, as well as um, mixed use residential projects. Um, the zoning ordinance has development standards, which are uh, provided in your staff report. Um, I think there was some discussion of the possibility of a specific plan. It would be Normally cities don't do specific plans about this limited um, type of area, but um, the council requested information and we're presenting that to you in any direction you may have. Thank you. And I'd just like to point out uh, to the council as well as the public who may have looked at, uh, I'm assuming that the color map is also in the council packet, there's a property that is one of the four that we're discussing and we've recently rezoned that. So this planning map, color-wise, is incorrect. They're all the light blue general commercial zone. This one property that was an island unto itself was recently rezoned to match the rest of this entire region. So just to make sure that that's clear to everybody. So are there any questions of staff on this item at this point? Councilmember Jacob? So there's no particular reason other than the council wanted information. We didn't have a reason for any information or do you remember what triggered it? <laughs> My understanding that the, there was a sense of that the properties might be an area of future redevelopment given that they're relatively underutilized um, and that that might be something that the council wants to weigh in about. To, yeah, I think that, yeah, to, when I looked at it, my concern was is could all four parcel, parcels be united and could we have a quick, simple and easy CVS development at the north end of town, right, where they united a bunch of parcels? So I guess one of the questions I'd have is could the council, uh, is there sufficient findings for concern around that type of thing and could the council uh, put a moratorium on or uh, further uh, have uh, events that allow the council to evaluate and mitigate any issues that can come from our few uh, individual parcels that we have left in the city uh, becoming fewer larger parcels. Well, there are, and these properties are each owned individually. That right there is a barrier to combination, although that can certainly occur. Um, these aren't the only underdeveloped or undeveloped properties in the city. There's other areas, um, and the city does have a um, pretty demanding review process, um, restrictions on maximum size of, of uh, commercial establishments, requirements for use permits at a certain size, and, and for some types of uses. So there are a range of existing development standards, and of course the city is also working on the formula business ordinance that may, in effect, create other restrictions on what, um, and requirements on, on what might be able to happen. I think it's the, really in the end, the council's judgment on this situation and whether you think additional measures are needed. So, what is, did you have more? Can I add to that? that a sequel review of any such project would be quite intensive in that area, I'm sure. Which is just what we thought about the CVS project. Yes. Uh, to but get we had to go down that path again. I'm yeah. quite certain. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, Sarah. Um, so, <laughs> so can, can I? Um, 
Uh, we, I, I missed the council meeting. I remember reading on the agenda uh, the used car lot potential for one of these yes. lots. What was the outcome of that situation? That was approved. Um, it's a limited number of vehicles. I think it's something like 15 or 18 vehicles on the front. It's an existing paved area of that property. Of the Marriott property? No, uh, yeah. the property, the, yeah. the northernmost property. The one that was rezoned from the yes. dark blue to the light blue? Yes. So that um, use is going forward from what we understand. Okay, and then um, can we, if we were interested in changing, there are controls on larger projects. Any individual commercial development exceeding 30,000 square feet requires a use permit. Any single non-residential use cannot exceed 35,000 square feet. Um, there is the firm of the business ordinance, which does not overlap at all. Um, and then there's this discussion, and I believe the 30,000 square foot use permit requirement is a completely separate ordinance. Which ordinance is that? Oh, it's in the zoning ordinance. It's in the zoning ordinance. And is there a resolution that would pass for that? No, it was just a zoning ordinance amendment that was intended to um, address the potential of um, very large um, formula business um, type uses. And as the character of our unique town potentially changes, uh, are we asking the general plan update committee to evaluate that 30,000 square foot marker? Um, well, the, the, this is in the zoning ordinance. The, thus far, that kind of limitation has not been discussed by the um, GPAC. Um, we'll see what comes out in the general plan process, and there will be a whole slew of zoning ordinance amendments. And in that context, even if it wasn't specifically highlighted, it is the kind of feature that the commissioner or council could direct you know, modification of those existing limits. And the council this evening could not make a modification to that 30,000 square foot because that's not what's agendized. Correct. Agenda. Okay. Thank you. Vice Mayor Gary. Uh, so I wanted to share with Council Member Jacob this item was mentioned by Council Member Eater at one meeting, uh, picked up by the Agenda Review Committee as an assignment to staff, and so it's come back as an informational item for the very concerns you were mentioning. I'm sorry, he's not here to express the, what motivated his remark. Uh, but I think when we look at the map, when we uh, see the intersection of Pearlbutt and Gravesty North, we've got the anchors on the top end of the community church in O'Reilly, but then we have all that blue area coming down to Redwood Marketplace. And so I was wondering how much staff knows about the uh, even-numbered parcels on the west side, so I'm trying to figure out which is which. It looks, I think 840 is the gas station. Former, yes. The former gas station. And then next to that is Taco Bell, is that 860? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. And then uh, I think 900 is the veterinarian. Uh, there's the vet and the, the wine shop. Right, and then there's the, and, um, the medical offices there, Barry Lentz's building in between. Yeah. So, uh, let's see, as the west side is developed and potentially subject to change nice. and because it's one story with parking lot in front of it. Uh, and then we have its counterpart on the east side, which is much less developed and bigger lots and lots that have been, I, looking at the information, I think uh, pretty long time ownership, maybe some more recent single transactions. So I think our concern was just that. Um, what do we see in this area? Is there a potential that we're missing with the zoning? Uh, and is there a concern about uniting the parcels to get a really giant project that is problematic for us? That those are the issues that I understood from before. And now I'm thinking, we may want to be aware of the west side as well. Any questions, Councilman Lewis? Well, actually, my question is about 
parcel 845, which is the proposed mixed use parcel. And um, that's kind of smack between 825, which is already completely developed. I used to have an office in that building then. Um, so it would seem that we're kind of hopscotching here. Um, so my, my question is actually, does it seem if we were to approve a mixed use uh, project in 845, which is kind of in the middle there, would that kind of set a trend for the use in the area? And it would prevent a, a consolidation thing happening. Uh, yes, if a project went forward on one lot, that, that would tend to mitigate against consolidation. Uh, and uh, if a project was approved, that might serve as some sort of model or potential model for other property owners, other developers, uh, if it was a successful project. Mm -hmm. All right, I will ask the public if anybody would like to speak on this item. We will close public comment. So as an informational item, uh, I'm feeling informed. And, uh, and, and I, I share the concern that was, that was voiced about the, the consolidation of these fairly large in-town parcels. However, I, I think being aware of the situation and what may occur may, uh, because now we're all on notice as to the size of these parcels, their current underuse, and now a potential redevelopment of one of them, that uh, I'm comfortable with being made aware, keeping an eye on them, we know what's going on up there, and I have a feeling that our, our rather stringent and extensive review process will allow us to have input should um, something that we're concerned with comes forward. Well, I'm not sure I have the same confidence, just in this regard. Uh, other bodies may have the responsibility and give approvals and without an appeal, the matter might not come to the council to decide, uh, despite this conversation. And who knows how much uh, other people pay attention to what we say or read our minutes or, or be engaged in our point of view about this. So I'm just wondering really what our choices are. This is too small an area to do a specific study. I mean, I, I just don't know what sort of cautions or like red flags or something that we might put on these properties. To me this feels like a design review guidelines issue again. And we continue for years we continue to bandy the design review guidelines rather than properly fund redesigning the design review guidelines. Um, and for me what I, I fear that I don't know because I'm not an architect or designer, but it sounds to me like this is another problem that we have in our town where uh, updated design review guidelines would create a beneficial solution. Because I'm not, I, I'm funny, I walk with the concern that, oh, they could all be put together and we could have some big, you know, seven story super Walmart in one spot. Um, but I just heard Councilman Glass talk about the concern that if we put one project in the middle, then we will be. Uh, Sort of making the idea of there being one development there harder. So I just, it's amazing that the difference there alone, um, but those are unique preferences uh, about what our interests are based off what we create in our head of project might look like there. Uh, where design review guidelines create a permanent long term solution to those types of issues. Um, so uh, I do share uh, Councilmember Gurney's uh, concern that. As easy as we say process will happen, it doesn't seem to ever happen that way. Um, and creating additional uh, markers uh, for staff and council to be notified that this is happening and have an ability to weigh in on those types of projects um, is something we should look into further. Good. 
staff is certainly on notice that if any activity occurs in this area, we'd be the first ones to tell the council about that. It's also possible that council can appeal items uh, in this area if we wish to do so. Council can appeal the item to itself. It does not need to be appealed by a citizen or someone. The council can appeal the item to itself. It does not imply any bias by doing so. It simply brings the item to itself on appeal. So staff's on notice as to that. The problem in this situation is it's either one extreme or the other in some ways. You kind of have to rely on what I was just talking about or you have to go to a considerable other extreme. As the planning director indicated, this is a very small area for any kind of a specific plan. The only way I can think of to impose any kind of a moratorium in that area would be to propose the entire area for a study, a specific plan of some sort. That's a lot of money. It's a small area. You know, it's doubtful that that makes sense from an economic or staff point of view to do any kind of a specific plan. So, um, short of that kind of, uh, we are planning, we are, you know, looking at this area intensely, therefore we need a moratorium. Short of that, I think the council is basically where I just alluded to in the beginning. You have to rely on staff to pay attention to this area, and council could conceivably appeal an item to itself. Council Member Bass? Well, this is um, you know, kind of the part of one of the gateways into our city. So um, my concern is that this area not turn into something like Fast Food Row or something that would really um, take away from the general feel of our city when you drive into it from that the north side. Um, but I am thinking that um, at least our, as we're moving forward with our formula ordinance, that um, that may uh, deal with that issue if we're um, having the formula ordinance apply here, uh, um, but, but uh, exempting the shopping center across the street. So that that would deal with part of our issue here in terms of not turning it into fast food row or something that looks super chunky. Uh, Mr. Thank you. So I want to understand how a council member appeals a decision. Uh, does does a council member do that as an individual and pay the fee and then be the appellant or what? It's not a fee when you appeal it to yourself. It's a procedure. And staff will have to admittedly look into this to make sure we do it right. There's been some controversy about it in other cities and even a lawsuit or two. But you have to do it right. The idea is the city council um, has an interest in an item and appeals it to itself. I believe one of the suits held there is no bias implied by doing that. You're not implying that you, would, you are for or against whatever you're appealing. You're simply saying that because of this subject matter, you wish the item to be appealed to you as the council. Um, well, one case involved a single council member doing that. We'll have to look into the procedure, but I know it can be done. So I'm uh, thinking of the recent most painful example where this might have been used is with the decision about Amy's. So that was a planning commission decision, and what I'm understanding is a council member could appeal a planning commission decision and bring it to this body. Believe that could have happened here. Okay, well, uh, that would be helpful if staff would make sure we all know the process to do that. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, okay. <laughs> is there anything else? All right, we will move on from this item. Oh, uh, one final request of staff. With the proposal for 845, if you can keep us abreast of, of yes. the developments with that project, we would appreciate it. So now we're moving on to item number eight, and this is brought to us by our public works superintendent, Rich Emmy, and this is the water usage and conservation on city ornamental lawns item that we've all been looking forward to all evening. Uh, staff report, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, Yes, that's what this issue is. Uh, water use and conservation. Um, so a little background, the city has a number of landscape areas to maintain on city property, uh, located in city parks, around the public buildings, and landscape medium strips and islands. 
of those landscape areas, lawns exist in the, all of the city's main parks, um, except of course the Laguna Preserve, at some of the public buildings and at some of the landscape islands. Um, some of the lawns are used by the public for recreational purposes, such as in the parks, and it makes sense to keep those irrigated and comfortable for people to use. And some are merely ornamental and receive little or no usage by the public. So it's been identified that the lawns of the police department, fire department, public works departments, and the um, community center, the strip in front of the sign, uh, Jason Morris Street, um, the little strip on Laguna Parkway, adjacent to Whole Foods, and the areas of Spooner Park, uh, where South Main and Pedal Avenue meet, and the little triangle where the tree is at Jewel and Willow on the uh, west side of Ives Park are strictly ornamental with little or no use by the public. So the discussion on this is, you know, should we keep these irrigated, fully irrigated, and, and obviously in consideration of the drought, the answer is no. Um, and we've already taken fairly recently uh, action to reduce the irrigation by 50% in these lawn areas that I've identified. Um, and we estimate that I, we actually are fortunate to have on staff a uh, fairly new employee that uh, actually has a uh, landscape architecture background. So I uh, utilized him and my sister Dante Del Pecte are pretty good in this and uh, went around and calculated what the, the flows were, um, what we were the way we were irrigating them and then by cutting them 50%. And um, made some calculations on the back of the staff report, but uh, we estimate that we'll save about uh, a little under 800,000 gallons of water in the seven months out of the year that we irrigate. It's typically, it depends on the, the weather, but it's usually end of March, first part of April to around October. Uh, of course, in the wintertime, irrigation is shut off. Um, in addition, we've turned off the irrigation for the second year on this hillside across the street by our, across from the community center. And uh, also recently at the Triangle uh, at Jewel and Willow, um, just west of Ives Park. And that will save, it's estimated, about 700,000 gallons a year of water. So um, we've also, Got some estimates for some signage we want to demonstrate to help uh, identify for the public that you know where to in our park to, uh, to uh, conserve water and to encourage the public to do so also. Uh, we kind of looked at some different wording and they could say something like do in our part to save water you can do it too or something like that. The signs would be about uh, 18 by 24 inch they could be posted in the lawn areas and they're a little over $100 a piece, about $125. Um, if directed by council, we can order some and place them around town. Uh, there's no question that drop tolerant landscaping is the obvious choice uh, as opposed to lawn and new installations. And I, don't think, uh, I know the city wouldn't be doing any uh, turf planting in around city buildings if there were any new air landscaping going in. Um, in existing landscape areas, however, it's, while it makes sense to retrofit, there is a cost associated with that. And it's not only preparing the doing the site work, um, kind of like what was done around City Hall and the library, the public works uh, assisted with a lot of that in the site preparation. Um, there's a cost associated with that. You know, there's a lot of staff time, there's redoing the irrigation. And then, um, of course, the, the plantings and the new material that's put down, whether it's uh, chips or mulch or something like that. Um, so we did, or my staff uh, researched that and estimated the cost to be about $525 per hundred square feet. Uh, we feel that's a pretty accurate uh, cost. And um, I went ahead and listed for you, we have, uh, just showing the, the reduction, it's kind of three parts, the reduction in the irrigation, the prior water use and then the reduction. So we see what kind of gallon, gallons of water we were using 
each individual site that I spoke about, and then the water savings, and then the cost to retrofit those, should we choose to do that in the future, which eventually we probably will. Um, so the total irrigation in those sites was estimated to be about 2.2 million gallons in the irrigation season, or we can say per year. Uh, of course, cutting it in half uh, would save, and then turning off those two irrigation of those two sites, which we've done, would save almost one and a half million gallons per year. Uh, I just wanted to mention that equates to about a uh, little under half, sorry, a little under uh, half of a percent of our total water pumped and sold each year. Uh, we pump and sell about 375 million gallons per year. And then the cost to retrofit all of those sites combined would be about $230,000. Um, you can see the individual costs. Uh, for instance, when the police department estimated that lawn area to be retrofitted, it would be about $47,000. That includes our cost uh, the public works staff use of the equipment for the use of these schedule. So the out of pocket cost would be less, but it's uh, important to note that while we do uh, those projects, then we're not doing other projects around town since we always have more time to do. So um, it'll be something that would have to be uh, accomplished when uh, we can make that work schedule for it. Um, so as noted, uh, we've already uh, taken action to conserve water in some of those areas. Uh, we should see things trying out a bit. It's an attempt, I guess at this point, unless otherwise directed, to cut back on the irrigation and not let everything die. And assuming in the winter time when we get some cooler weather and some rainfall, which I, I hope we will, then uh, these will come back until we can take some action to retrofit the landscaping. Um, so there's no cost associated with doing that, just in fact there's a savings, a slight, slight pump savings, so uh, electricity, but there's a savings in water also. And then I just wanted to finally point out that, uh, just for your information, you see that we, we are tracking our water conservation. We're not required to report that to the state as a lot of other cities in the county are because we're not part of the, we're not an urban water provider. You know, we, are, we do have a city and we are urban, but uh, by the definition of it, we are. So, but we do track it and um, uh, we're saving 34% overall. That's very good. Um, includes commercial residential uh, irrigation. And, and that's based on, just like everybody else is tracking in all the other cities, it's, it's month to month or quarter to quarter based on 2013, the baseline year. So um, my recommendation would be that the, the city council approved some uh, an authorized replacement of informational signs, as I spoke of, um, around uh, the lawns that I mean, it's important that you know the lawns are going dry. We want to wait until they go dry before we place our signs, so that we're sending a consistent message. But that should happen fairly quickly, um, and then. Uh, Continue to work with the uh, house staff, work with the subcommittee, Vice Mayor uh, Gurney, and Councilmember Glass on the water conservation and landscape efforts of uh, retrofits of uh, city properties. All right. And that's my report. Uh, question When did the 50% cutback in the irrigation occur at these? Um, two weeks ago. Just two weeks ago? Yeah. So we haven't really seen. So uh, that looks like it. Uh, I hear that uh, Spooner Park's drying out pretty quickly. I think it has to do with the type of soil down there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, I have to, <laughs> have to drive by and look and see what they look like. Right. But, um, we can always come back more too. And, and we'll monitor that and do so if we deem it appropriate. Because of our size and the limits that are for larger communities, other municipalities have essentially completely stopped watering everything, or do you have any information in you know, parks and things like that that are that are heavy use?
used by the public. Yeah, I haven't seen other, well, like Santa Rosa and other towns have been in there. The, the parks that are in use still have uh, green lawns. Um, they probably take an action to do pretty much the same thing uh, where the lawns weren't being used by anyone. For instance, the, the community center just next door, uh, the little strip in front of the sign, don't really see anyone using that. However, the nice lawn area in front of the building, people are, I look out my window from my office, people are uh, pretty regularly on that. So it makes sense to let that be used by the public, just like the one out by the library. Other questions of staff? Please. Thank you for doing such a detailed work effort. I was wondering uh, if we would know how much we can dial back our water usage and not completely kill the lawn, but have it go brown. And I didn't realize the 50% reduction was so recent. So that doesn't really test it for us. No, we're, we're going to keep an eye on that. So we're definitely, if we get direction to have some informational signs, educational signs put out there, um, we're not going to put them in a green lawn. That would be silly. Uh, so I think, you know, with the, with the weather, uh, give it a couple more weeks and see how it looks. We might cut it back another 25% or so. Um, you know, I, don't, I don't really know. I think we have to just monitor it. Okay. Comes from everyone else? I was just wondering if we were to invest in more drought tolerant landscaping, if some of that can get funded out of the water and sewer fund, because we've been mandated by the state to cut on water use. Just a thought, a question. I definitely don't know the answer to that one as I sit here this evening. I mean, there's a concern I have that that is for things directly related to infrastructure or water supply. Uh -huh. um, I, I can understand how you make the linkage there, so we'll, we, we will look into it. But I wouldn't, as I sit here this evening, I wouldn't rely on that as, okay. as an idea. Thank you. It, it could be here, see what I recall. Did we ask, saying that? Petaluma funded their lawns to cardboard mulch program through the water fund, the water conservation effort. Okay. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? We'll close public comment and have some final discussion. I'm interested in certainly funding the, the signs. I think that's a great way to go. I'm also interested in letting Public Works handle this and monitor the condition of the lawns. I understand certainly that the Chiefs would like their lush green lawns. It looks very nice when it's like that. However, um, it's a different reality these days. And when the rains come, they'll green right back up and we'll all be happy again. So um, that, that's my little wrap up. Anybody else have anything to say? Well, thank you. Uh, actually, it would be my priority that we water uh, lawn that has a public use and a recreational use to it and not water ornamental lawns, even if that meant them going brown and looking poorly. Uh, I understand that the police department and fire department and public works may feel very proud to have a nice looking facility. That makes sense to me because you're all sharp in your uniforms and trucks, etc. Uh, but I think as a city consuming water, we need to uh, role model what we're asking our consumers to do and let those non-recreational lawns go brown. And I, I, my front yard looks really ugly, but I would say, you know, a dead lawn is the badge of conservation now. That's how I rationalize it looking bad. So my preference would be that we uh, direct public works to let those particular lawns go. And uh, the one that, that I'm specifically saving from that would be this area in front of the community center as it comes over to behind the annex and the labyrinth and the Peace Park. Because I believe Diana uses this a lot for her events and people do hang out there. The little strip there and public works down slope and the public works on the other side. And 
place of fire forever. Spooner Park can go. I mean, people don't walk out to that park and have lunch out there. So when you say let them go around, are you let saying go around. zero water? water? Zero water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or if we prefer a more conservative, conserving approach, we could turn it, dial it back to 25% and see what happens. And if there's some concern for safety or appearance that our staff would like to bring to us, I'd be receptive to that. Mm -hmm. If people here are more comfortable, dialing it down more slowly, and then quick to zero. I'm hearing, I guess, for myself, two value questions. One is, is that do we want to ask the public works department to monitor water in these lawns to the point of them turning brown, but trying to maintain their life as much as possible. And two is, is doing as a city council does not want laws that aren't necessary into the future. And um, uh, we don't want laws period into the future. We want to spend the next however many years coming up with the $525 per square foot, which totaled $230,000 to put in drought resistance landscaping. And we just know that now we want an effort to get rid of lawns, then I would understand supporting to stop watering them, let them turn brown. <clears throat> um, but if we want to try to hold on to the lawns in the hope that um, it's going to start raining this winter, or even this summer, and that the drought's going to be over in the next year or two, and we're going to be able to revitalize, revitalize and maintain those lawns because we want them, then the current plan is there. And maybe I would push to Sarah or to to councilman, to vice mayor, to <laughs> get it out. <laughs> um, um, uh, position uh, to uh, ask staff to continue pushing towards the browning while maintaining life till the winter. Um, I also would be supportive in, in a council discussion of us no longer maintaining lawns that are necessary as a, uh, but that's more around permaculture and food and, and all kinds of pieces. And I, Value-wise, I'm already there. I'm just not sure if we'll make the decision here. And then finally, I thought I heard two people talk about their chiefs wanting their lawns, but I never heard from the chiefs that they wanted their lawns. So I just, I just know the chiefs' lawns are on this list. So I just wanted to, I think that we've made up that the chiefs want their lawns. Um, I, I don't see police officers with signs or anything. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I just, I just want to point out that we, that we, I think that we have an assumption because they're on the well, list, but that that, is, that that hasn't been expressed. That, my expression was that the chiefs, as do public works, as do all departments, want their facilities to look sharp. And the, what we have had to date is lawns. And so if it is drought resistant landscaping that's attractive, I think we're all happy with that. So, Councilmember Brillas? I'd just like to um, support Councilmember Gurney's point about um, prioritizing lawns that are used versus lawns that are or ornamental. Um, and, but I also would like to say maybe to dial back, just um, as Council Member Bernie said, maybe to 25%. Um, my concern is if we, uh, if we absolutely let the lawns completely die, and I would bow to public works expertise in this area, because I don't know how long it takes to go along. Seem fairly good at doing it myself, but um, uh, um, I felt the same thing. Saying something about my neighborhood. Um, uh, I think that if we if we let it die completely, we have other issues to think about, which is um, soil erosion and um, topsoil going into our storm drain system, et cetera, if we completely kill off the lawn, uh, unless we are going to invest immediately in drought tolerant landscaping. So I think, you know, keep it at the, those ornamental lawns that just barely hang it in there, um, while um, the rest of our lawns that people actually use are still usable and not getting killed out of use with um, less water. Okay. I think that is the reasonable course of action here. Uh, at this point, I, I uh, am not encouraging us to have a conversation about re-landscaping every public building in town. Uh, that's just, I think, beyond our 
financial ability is beyond my head getting around right now, given all the other more important issues and the pace of the <coughs> project and cost there. So, um, let's see, do we need a motion on this or just direction to staff? I believe it's just direction to staff, correct? Are, are you referring to staff doing the signs? I would prefer a motion. Okay, I will entertain a motion. Oh. Uh, so, I don't know what the wording on the sign should be. Does staff want us to work out the wording tonight? Or leave it up to staff? You can try to leave it up to staff. Um, Councilmember Jacob said guilt and shame work. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that's his recommendation. Uh -huh. yeah. So, uh, at $123 each, how many lawns are we putting signs on? The, this list here? Eight. 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 I mean, it's $1,000 for signs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I sort of thought the brown dead lawn was advertising enough that we were concerned about. <laughs> Rather than spending the $1,000, but if y'all want signs, we're doing our part, you do yours. Yeah, that's fine with me. Okay. I think that there's some value on the signs. More so, I think that there's the opposite question that will come up is, why is our student city letting the adult bonds die? Right? People who are not as keyed into drought issue, which you can just drive around town and see. Um, so I think that the signs also explain the fact that we're letting them die and why. Um, versus uh, also telling the public that they should let their lawns die as well. It's funny, I just came back from the Central Valley where you drive around and everyone's only allowed to water exterior plants one day a week for like five minutes and just watching the whole place turn brown, this whole like, you know, neighborhood <laughs> of, of sprawl. Um, it's just very interesting to see the drastic measures that are being taken an hour and a half from here and the fact that in, in, in what it looks like here, really nothing. So I think that calling out that intention is worth it. I think the public education around $1,000 for public education, engaging the issue to conserve water, reduce water usage, when we look at it from that perspective, um, it's a less than a mailer. Um, it, it cost effective, I believe, is we've all had it all located in prime visual location. You have convinced me, uh, because the question I get is, when is our stupid city water at salons? That, that, that's the question I'm getting, and no one will be, oh, okay, clearly we need to uh, get the message across. So I would move that we direct staff to uh, dial back the water to these eight lawns below 50%, just to the point where uh, it's brown but not dead. That's a technical landscape term. <laughs> and uh, purchase the signs with the save water, do your part message. Is there a second for that? All right, any further discussion? Call the question, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Back. Four zero or three one? Four, four zero. Moving to item number nine. This is an item that the Vice Mayor and I bring to the Council regarding Council Initiative Funds. Now let's give a little report on this item. There is a line item in the budget uh, that is $2,500 divided by five. Each of us has the $500 for uh, various um, initiatives that we feel that need a little bit of funding. And so during the budget discussion, we had a very uh, brief discussion about perhaps increasing Sebastopol World Friends Community Benefit Grant to cover their annual transportation cost. And because of the timing and then the discussion that was brought up right there, that there was interest on the behalf of the council to dedicate some of the council initiatives funds towards Sebastopol World Friends and leave the budget intact as it was and not make any further modifications to it at that date is why this item is now before us so that we can hopefully move forward on the suggestion of Council Member Eater that evening 
to fund World Frames as well as any other um, uh, organizations or reasons uh, to disperse, disperse the funds. And I do have a, a communication from Council Member Eater um, that he is in favor of this item and that he will fund an equal amount to the amounts pledged by the other council members and that he would also like to fund with his remaining balance the purchase of an automated electronic defibrillator to be installed in a city facility where it is determined by uh, public safety to provide the greatest benefit perhaps the senior center community center or who knows so that's uh, Council Member Eater's thoughts on this item. So, is are there questions of me or staff on this item? Thanks, Mayor Jerry. I'm just uh, wondering what the cost is for transportation. I got confused at the meeting. Is it five hundred dollars or a thousand or over a thousand? It's usually between five hundred and a thousand. It's usually in the six hundred and fifty to seven hundred and fifty dollar range every year. For the, for the bus to get the traveling groups to and from the airport. Vice Mayor, I mean, excuse me, Council Member Glass? Not yet. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> as I was down, I said I would um, pledge uh, 100 towards this out of my funds, and so I'm certainly. Um, willing to do what I said, what mm -hmm. I committed to, and I'm not sure I want to commit to anything else at this particular time, but I want to commit to the $100 that I said at that meeting. Okay. Well, let's see. Before we move any further, I will ask for public input on this. Any member of the public wish to speak on this item? Okay, we'll move forward with council discussion. I'm willing to, if, if, if we each, provide $150 out of our initiative fund spread across five council members at $750 that covers their shortfall and it's uh, equally spread that leaves a reasonable balance in each of our initiatives funds for future items who knows what comes down the road council member Eater has already indicated his preference for the balance of his funds for this year Please. So it says that if we change it, then staff would amend the community benefit grants for spousal or friends. So if we give initiative funds, the community benefit grant wouldn't need to be amended. It would be two completely separate things. So are we also, do we have the option here of just adding money through the community benefits grant to World Friends and not touching our initiative funds, or do we have to use our initiative funds, because, or is that just a misprint of the staff report? Well, the budget, yeah. the budget was approved. Yeah. Uh, so. You don't go down the budget to change the community grants, so I think this is sort of like a typo. Okay, so that's not an option right now? No, because no. The, the title of this item is not messing with the budget. Okay. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. I support doing that and nothing else. Okay. The one fifth payment towards the. I think that Councilor Eater wished to provide the rest of his friends to the defibrillator to the uh, Chief Braga's mm -hmm. wishes, so we should process that. Or should we wait for Councilor Eater to return? He was comfortable moving forward with this item. So, so we could make that part of our motion. To do that for him? Correct. Yeah. Wait, we want to do it the rest of this. No, we're spending all of That's why he's safe, sending that information in. I was going to say, what do you say? I'll see you and call you too or something? There's some poker term for that. I can't think of it. Uh, so what I would like to do is meet everybody's match, uh, fun, whatever that, if it's 100, I would think we might just bump it up to 150 for everybody. And then we were close to getting the bus funded. And what I would like to do is provide that in a personal check and then dedicate my full 500 to the landscape fund. 
That way I'm meeting everybody's, but through a different source than my council initiatives money, and I'm spending all my initiatives money now, so I don't need to hear about it again. <laughs> okay. Would that be okay with everybody? 150? I brought my checkbook. Want to see it? <laughs> it's a real checkbook. <laughs> Question and that's that um, new kid on the block here. Do we have to say how we are spending our council initiative funds individually? We don't have to approve that. That's why it's a council initiative fund, right? We don't All have to, us to approve any individual spending. Any individual mm -hmm. spending? Oh, okay. Yes, and that's kind of why with, uh, we put it all together here in case people wanted to do other things so it didn't come back piece by piece, 100 mm -hmm. by 100. That's different than it works at the Board of Supervisors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I will make a motion that, that let's see, that Council Member Eater, Council Member Glass, Council Member Jacob, and Mayor Slater each dedicate $150 to the Special World Friends, that Council Member Eater dedicate the balance $350 towards a defibrillator. And I don't know what those cost, so I think this might just be a deposit towards one. And that Vice Mayor Gurney dedicate her full $500 to the library landscaping project. Any further discussion? I would just like it noted in the motion that uh, I am committing my 150 personal funds. Okay, so noted. Because you want to obligate me to do that in your motion. I should. Yeah. And committing her full 500 to, to the library yes. lens. Yeah. I'd like to amend the motion. Okay. Uh, to dedicate my additional 350 to the library landscape fund. So I'll be finished as well. I'll be <coughs> back on the initial, I will make that amendment to the motion. Who seconded it? I did. Okay. I'll second your amendment. Thank you. No further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. No opposed? Carries. And it's time for a break, I think. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Item number 10. Uh, designation of voting delegate and alternates at the League of California Cities Annual Conference which is held at the end of September this year in San Jose. Staff report? Or I yes, guess as the mayor indicated, indicated, this is to designate a city voting delegate welcome for those to use who are attending the League of Cities Annual Conference. So, to date, I believe, Council Member Glass and myself are the only confirmed attendees, so I think it probably makes good sense that that both of us be designated as voting delegates. Yes. We need a primary and a secondary. Yes. Well, then I would like to uh, suggest that Council Member Glass be the primary, and I will be the alternate. Well, thank you, but isn't the mayor usually uh, the primary? It could be anybody. The primary has to be a lot of places that I want to be there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just to vote on a it, It's, um, I, I, I would be happy to be voting delegate and you would be voting delegate alternate. Either way is fine with me. I think that's what she prefers. So is there a motion to that effect? Is there a second to that effect? Second. I'll second it. Thanks for going. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries. Now we'll take a break. Um, <laughs> city council reports, city manager, city attorney, city clerk. I have a brief report um, on the status of the CVS project. As you may have noticed, uh, they are cleaning up the site upon our request. Yeah, that it. was happening today. The high weeds and shrubs are leaving. Yeah. We thought they were a fire fire hazard. We appreciate them uh, finally doing that. Um, staff has uh, been discussing with the engineers uh, for the CVS team on the timing of the building demolition and construction. We have been told uh, this may be possibly optimistic, but their schedule is they are opening the bids for actual construction on July 30th, and they anticipate pulling permits 
including the demolition permit, the first week in August. Uh, again, that may be possibly optimistic. We've already taken a look at their proposed demo permit that may not have a current air quality uh, approval with it. So uh, take it with a grain of salt, but we've been told first week in August. <laughs> Oh yes, and room, City Clerk reminds me to remind all of us that the employee recognition luncheon is at Ives Park on this Thursday, 11.45. Got it? City Council reports. We have one here from Vice Mayor Gurney. Yes, there it all is, and I would like to thank Mary for helping me get this to you uh, in time for this evening. I'd rather you just read your way through it if you have questions. Uh, the packet is online and you're welcome to contact me. Thank you. And I want to um, congratulate us for getting this far through the Laguna Bridge construction project without too many uh, problems or complaints. This far. This, this far? This I mean, far. we got it to today. <laughs> okay. Council communication? Or did you have a report? Please. Please. Some short verbal reports. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, um, I sat for you on Snow Clean Power mm -hmm. and just wanted to update you on that. Um, uh, the, the most important issue was really a uh, review of the structure of Sonoma Clean Power and whether there might be a change to the JPA agreement. Um, and that had to do with the advisory committee. So there is a business advisory and a technical advisory committee. Um, I'm saying that right. Uh, Rate payers advisory rate payers, yeah, okay. yeah. And um, uh, so the, the general consensus of almost everybody, or actually everybody who spoke, was go slow, it's actually working, minor tweaking, don't make any big changes. So there was, um, I, didn't, I didn't hear um, any big push for let's change the, the JPA agreement, let's change the structure. Um, everybody seemed to feel that, in general, things are working well, um, that there might be some minor tweaks, and uh, it was kind of keep an eye on it. So, um, in general, that all seems to be working pretty well. Um, the other issue that was discussed was AB 1110, which is um, a bill in the assembly that has to do with uh, requiring um, consistent measurement of carbon emissions and in terms of your um, reporting out of your energy portfolio. And so the Sierra Club and some other groups were supporting AB 1110. Sonoma Clean Power felt that there's one aspect of it which has to do with variable energy production or en energy production from variable sources that would include smaller hydro, like not class one hydro, and um, and wind power. So these, this is the kind of energy production that doesn't just produce all the time; it, it changes. Um, and SCP felt that they would be at something of a disadvantage if this bill passes, um, because that kind of production was being classified in this kind of miscellaneous carbon output um, category that puts it kind of in the same category as natural gas. So um, uh, I guess we, Sonoma Clean Power has a new lobbyist and they're going to work with the assembly to try and fix it. So mm -hmm. that was my SCP report. Um, also wanted to let you know I went to, I'm the Laguna Foundation person. I went to the um, Laguna Foundation's 25th anniversary get-together um, on Sunday, and a good time was had by all, and everybody celebrated how far we've come, and it was very interesting to think, I remember 25 years ago, preserving the Laguna was kind of controversial, and um, now it's sort of like nobody would think of dumping apple effluent in the Laguna, and um, 
and it was, you know, everybody's on board with preserving the Laguna. So anyway, it was a very, very lovely event, um, and they introduced their new executive director. Mon his last name, his name's Mr. Monroe, and I think it's Keith Monroe. Thank you for those reports. And the Ledge Committee, Mayor's and Council Members Legislative Committee, uh, recently voted to send a letter regarding AB 11 and 10 uh, in opposition as well. Okay. So, Council Communications, future dates are noted. We're adjourned. Mm -hmm.